Perhaps you've witnessed the following scenario. Someone posts a link on Facebook about a racial incident. A dozen people comment about how racist this country is, and a few people make comments that are somewhat angry or harsh in tone. Then somebody new enters into the conversation and pushes back against the whole feed by saying things like, white privilege doesn't exist, or all lives matter, and not just black, or social justice is a distraction to the gospel, or we should not talk about race because it is divisive, and the most important thing is that we are all Christians. Now all the earlier commentators get really mad. They pillory the dissenting voice as ignorant or racist, and indeed as proof, him or herself, positive, that the original comment about how racist this country is true because this person is so racist. The thread goes on all day. It goes on to about 150 comments as everybody is going back and forth with each other, um, probably during class or in meetings or during chapel when they're supposed to be thinking about things like God. Finally, everybody gets too angry to continue anymore. They say, forget it, I'm out, peace. There's a little bit of calm for a couple of days and then the next outrage hits the internet. And the same cycle happens over and over again. Something like this dynamic seems to have taken over our national discourse on race. And it worries me. We are not moving forward, we are moving backward. Our conversations do not generate light and mutual understanding. They spin us into more intense forms of polarization, outrage, and cynicism. I wonder how will we rebuild trust across these polarized lines? How can we rebuild the social fabric of this country so there's some sort of common identity and voice? And what can Christians do to enhance our discourse about race? I was excited about the opportunity to speak for this series because of the title because what it's suggesting is that we need new conversations about race. And one of the ways that we can do that is by extending beyond the white-black binary. Our national discourse about race has been dominated by white-black voices, um, and there's a legitimate reasons for that. I think that there's something especially pernicious about the way that this country has treated African Americans and Native Americans, to go back to the earlier speaker. Yet there are other racial communities in this country that have also experienced oppression, and it may be by exploring those stories that we can together make progress in our racial discourse in ways that benefit all minorities and whites, black, brown, red, yellow, and white allies together. So in my remarks, I wanna broaden our discourse about race by focusing on my own community, Asian American, and to explore the distinct contributions we might offer to our national discourse about race. Three contributions that I think Asian Americans can offer. Number one, Asian Americans can help expose the prevalence of America's white power structures. We can be a contributing prophetic voice. Sociologist Claire Jean Kim has argued that the unique role that Asian Americans play in terms of the racial dynamics in this country is with regard to racial triangulation. We are triangulated vis-a-vis -vis whites and blacks in ways that elevate white superiority and denigrate African Americans into a lower posture of inferiority in the social status. This happens through two specific mechanisms. One's called relative valorization, and the other is civic ostracism. Relative valorization means that Asians are placed above other minority groups in terms of social status. But social ostracism means that we are excluded and treated uniquely as outsiders and foreigners in ways that other communities might not. Whereas the story of African Americans in this country is one of oppression, the story of Asian American tends to be that of exclusion. We are less likely to be called inferior and more likely to be called foreigners or outsiders. I'll just give you an example of how this works. So I live in a black neighborhood and it's lower income where a lot of folks might not even have a high school degree. They may be on food stamps. They might not be working. But it's not unusual for me to walk down the street and to have somebody shout out to me, Yao Ming or Ching Chong. And this is sort of strange because I'm a professor, I'm of higher socioeconomic status, I have higher level of education generally than people in my neighborhood, yet I'm made to feel like an outsider, like I don't belong, like this isn't my country, even though I was born and raised here, I don't have another country to go to. This is my citizenship. How is it possible for somebody, um, for, for that dynamic to play out in that kind of way? The answer is found in the history of Asians in America, which is not very widely known. 
Asians first came to this country en masse as a replacement for chattel black slavery after the Civil War. In the late 1800s, as the US was expanding westward, US companies recruited heavily in Asia, in China especially, to lure workers to come to America to build a transportation infrastructure, especially the California, um, the transcontinental railroad that would begin in California and move eastward. California had to do this because it had declared itself to be a free state and it couldn't rely on black labor. So why was it going, how was it going to find cheap labor? It would find it internationally and they chose to recruit in Asia, they went to China and to Japan to bring over laborers for the railroads and then for the sugar canes um, in Hawaii for the Japanese. The labor the Chinese provided was voluntary. So this was not slavery technically. And they were treated better than black slaves were. But they were also never treated as equals to Americans. And they were targeted for expulsion as soon as they were seen to be a threat to white American interests. So they're seen as sort of a temporary fill gap until you know, the end of reconstruction and you can rely on cheap black labor again. Shortly after the railroad was completed, white Americans began accusing the Chinese of stealing their jobs, calling for the removal, and terrorizing those who would not leave. The largest lynching in US history was actually against the Chinese. And it was in LA. It wasn't in the Deep South and it wasn't African Americans. It was actually Chinese. In 1871, there was a mob of 500 people in LA which was one-tenth of the population of the city at that time. They rounded up Chinese out of their homes and um, hung 17 Chinese people in a downtown gallows. Now, in terms of a national phenomenon, of course, black lynchings um, was more prevalent. But the single largest moment of lynching in American history was the Chinese. In 1882, the US passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred the entry of Chinese laborers um, into the country and prohibited the Chinese from becoming naturalized citizens. That is the first time in US history that Congress has ever passed legislation barring immigration to this country exclusively on the grounds of nationality, ethnicity, or race. Another example of this racial triangulation concerns the model minority myth, which is a dominant way that Asian Americans are described in this country today. This term has not existed forever. It first entered public consciousness in 1966 through a very specific series of articles in, mainline, um, in mainstream uh, media outlets. There are two reasons why this, this myth arose. One was criticism by, criticism by black and Hispanic activists that the civil rights reforms had not gone far enough. And the other was a Cold War interest in demonstrating the superiority of US's racial democracy over communism, which was a hard sell if the US was oppressing its own citizens. In 1966, a watershed article appears in US News and World Report that celebrates Asians as model minorities in order to argue against providing any kind of government benefits to blacks and Hispanics. Quote, at a time when Americans are awash in worry over the plight of racial minorities, one such minority, the nation's 300,000 Chinese Americans, is winning wealth and respect by dint of its own hard work, personal responsibility. Still being taught in Chinatown is the old idea that people should depend on their own efforts and not a welfare check in order to reach America's promised land. Visit Chinatown USA and you will find an important racial minority pulling itself up from hardship and discrimination to become a model of self-respect and achievement in today's America at a time when it is being proposed that hundreds of billions of dollars be spent to uplift Negroes and other minorities the nation's 300,000 Chinese Americans are moving ahead on their own with no help from anyone else. Do you can, see, can you see how this works? It's a white author saying, Asians are great, what's wrong with black folks? And do you also see why this might actually be really appealing to Asian Americans who experience discrimination and just wanna feel safe in this country? And why it is important for us to have multiple voices to say, wait a second, what works for Asians doesn't work for black or brown folks, and we need to have a conversation about this. We need to interrogate this idea of a model minority myth. Number two, Asian Americans can help enable new narratives about our communities. It's been commonly reported that 81% of evangelicals voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 election. That number is not entirely accurate. That was 80% white evangelicals. The number for Asian American evangelicals was 37 huge difference between white versus Asian American evangelicals. 
What accounts for this difference? I'm not a sociologist, but I suspect the answer has something to do with our distinct histories, white evangelical versus Asian American evangelical, which sheds light on evangelicalism as a whole and some of the major problems that are confronting us. As a standard account of evangelicalism goes, this movement has its roots in fundamentalism, which arose as a response to developments in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, such as the rise of Protestant liberalism, which began to compromise on core doctrines like the authority of scripture and the divinity of Christ. The fundamentalists broke from the main line in the 1920s, then evangelicalism emerged in the mid 20th century as individuals and institutions um, like Billy Graham, Christianity Today, the National Association of Evangelicals, and Trinity um, sought to retain orthodox doctrine while also being more broadly engaged in the world. Throughout this process, evangelicalism came to be associated with an emphasis on personal salvation, on conversion and evangelism, while Protestant liberalism came to be associated with social justice. And because Protestant liberals held to social justice but not the divinity of Christ, if you care about social justice, you don't care about the gospel. That's a narrative. So within evangelicalism, every time somebody says social justice, you can expect the response, what about the gospel? That's not my story, at least not simplistically. As a Korean American, I trace my faith back to American missionaries who came over to my country, my motherland, in the late 1800s. Methodist and Presbyterian missionaries who shared the gospel there. They believed in the Bible, they accepted Jesus Christ in their heart as their personal Lord and Savior, they promoted conversion and evangelism. In the early 1900s, my grandparents were suffering Japanese colonial rule, where my grandmother had a Japanese name and was forced to speak Japanese. That's, why she tutored, that's how she was able to tutor my sister in Japanese when my sister took um, Japanese in high school. In the mid 20th century, my parents were going through the Korean War. And my dad took shrapnel in his leg when he was um, a young boy, I think six, seven, eight years old, and was carried to, um, to safety by his older sister, who he's loyal to for the rest of his life because of that. We weren't allowed really in the country until 1965. There are immigration laws against us. And so my grandmother, once a law was passed, in 1965, US immigration law was passed to allow Asians to come in en masse, my grandmother immigrated in 1967, and my parents came over in 1970. Then, my parents started going to a Korean American church in Northern Virginia that Dr. Cha knows very well. That was basically just a transplant of Christianity um, from Korea to America. And we didn't know anything about the fundamentalist modernist controversy. I didn't know that social justice was bad. I just thought I was Christian. I didn't know that I was an evangelical. <laughs> I, I was born in 1978. I don't think I ever heard that, you know, social justice is a threat to evangelism or that America is God's chosen country, or that all Democrats are bad and worldly. I think I did hear that Korea was God's chosen country, <laughs> but living in America, that would sort of challenge American exceptionalism, which itself is a kind of heresy, I would think. Um, the primary places where I first confronted evangelicalism were my white parachurch campus ministry during college, Trinity here, and Wheaton, now where I teach. As Western public discourse has become so polarized between the left and the right, I don't know where I belong. I feel like I'm constantly getting sucked into battles that are not my own, on terms that are dictated by white liberals and white conservatives and not by the communities I come from and represent. I'm too liberal for conservatives, I'm too conservative for liberals. I'm attracted to evangelicalism, sincere, lived piety. I believe in the Bible, I accept Jesus as my savior. But I also care about social causes that a lot of conservatives seem to consider a distraction from the gospel, and I don't see a contradiction there at all. And I've increasingly come to see this liminality, this in-betweenness, as a gift for these times. Throughout my eight years at Wheaton, my wife and I have lived and worshipped in Lawndale, which is a low-income African-American uh, neighborhood in Chicago's west side, with some of the highest rates of poverty, violent crime, and incarceration in the city. So far as I'm aware, um, we are the only Asian American family in that neighborhood. Our community includes a local black population, as well as a relocating population of outsiders who have chosen to live in our neighborhood to serve the community. This population of relocators is mostly white, but includes some African Americans and then my one Asian family. There are racial tensions between these communities, local black, relocating black, relocating white. As Asian Americans, my wife and I frequently find ourselves standing in the gap and hearing it from both sides. 
our black friends expressed to us their frustrations that yes, well-meaning relocators do have racial biases and blind spots. Black leaders are often overlooked in our community by white relocators. And many of the nonprofits in our community manifest the same racial dynamics that they are founded to resist. Our white friends tell us how tired they are of being judged for the color of their own skin. So it's that no matter what they do to serve our community, how long they've lived there, how they've given their entire life to this community that they didn't have to live in, they're still being told that they don't have any voice and can't exercise their gifts just because they're white. And they've been there for decades and they're tired of hearing this. My wife and I understand both sides. We get that we, we understand the white side because our whole life has basically been trying to assimilate into white circles to survive in this country so that we feel protected. But we get the black side because we're minorities and we have also experienced marginalization and tokenization and we understand the social and epistemological significance of race. We do not fit into the black-white binary which sometimes makes us feel lost and forgotten in the conversation but it's precisely because we're in the middle that we sometimes have unique opportunities to operate as bridge builders and reconcilers. And I would like to think that this is a gift that Asian Americans can offer to our conversations about race. We're not frequently known for having a prophetic voice. You might associate that more with a black church. But we are known for building up community and harmony and you know, not wanting conflict at all. <laughs> and that might fit a little better with a priestly ministry. Maybe not prophetic as much, but priestly as a community that can speak peace into communities that are at war with each other, which isn't a bad thing for our time in um, our polarized context like our own. Number three, Asian Americans can help inspire new visions for justice. So in the courses that I teach at Wheaton, I spend a lot of time talking with my students about racial justice in urban contexts, which in Chicagoland means that a lot of our conversations are about wealthy white suburbanites serving in some way lower income black urban contexts. This conversation tends to make my predominantly white students uncomfortable. They feel a sense of guilt about their complicity in these racial and socioeconomic divisions, but they also don't know how to get involved, and they worry that even if they did get involved, this might fall in, they might fall into some kind of white messiah complex that would make things even worse. Last semester, for the first time, I discovered a new way to help my students to work through these issues, and I found it completely unexpectedly in a book written by an Asian American author. Russell Jung's memoir, At Home in Exile, I just learned earlier that Russell um, Jung was a, a speaker for Mosaic um, a few years ago. Jung is a fifth century Chinese American sociologist of religion who teaches at San Francisco State University. Um, he has, he's a Christian with university roots and he lives in Oakland in a low-income community of Cambodian refugees. And I connect with his story because I am also an Asian American relocator but I like his story um, as a point of contrast because he's an Asian in an Asian community and doesn't have to do, deal with a racial divide. That's not an experience that he's, he's navigating. As a Chinese American, he is culturally and linguistically different from Cambodian, his Cambodian neighbors, but he doesn't experience the same kind of racial difference that I face in my own community. I was reflecting on this matter autobiographically with my white students and suddenly I said, hey, here's a question, white students. How would you feel as wealthy suburban white people if God called you to serve in a low-income white community? They immediately gasped. It was like this giant weight had been taken off their shoulders. And then they didn't know what to do about it because they both felt freed and really confused and bewildered. On the one hand, they wouldn't have to fear that if I were to get involved in an African-American context, I'd get a negative response because my ancestors were the slave masters. I wouldn't always have to apologize for my, white, my, my whiteness. This was sort of liberating for them. On the other hand, they did not have the best stereotypes of low-income whites either. They started picturing trailer parks, burnt out, desolate rural areas where there are no more factory jobs, places and communities that sounded a lot less exciting you know, if you're trying to raise support for some urban mission, or for some mission project than you know, going to the hood in a low-income black neighborhood. What would it look like for rich whites and poor whites to be in community with each other? Is this something that even either side would even want? I'll tell you one person who did want something like that, Martin Luther King. 
Everyone knows him as a civil rights leader who did a lot to promote racial justice for African Americans. Fewer people know that he also had a heart for poor whites, who he also considered to be victims of southern white, the, the southern white aristocracy that triangulated poor whites vis-a-vis -vis rich whites and blacks. In his concluding speech on the march to Selma, sorry, from, from Selma to Montgomery, he spoke about how during Reconstruction, former black slaves and poor white masses started to realize that they were both getting fleeced by the southern aristocracy and they started to organize against the white aristocracy. Jim Crow was introduced to keep this voting bloc from coalescing and threatening white aristocratic power. Quote, if it may be said of the slavery era that the white man took the world and gave the Negro Jesus, then it may be said of the Reconstruction era that the southern aristocracy took the world and gave the poor, man, the poor white man Jim Crow. He gave him Jim Crow. And when his wrinkled stomach cried out for the food that his empty pockets could not provide, he ate Jim Crow, a psychological bird that told him that no matter how bad off he was, at least he was a white man better than the black man. And he ate Jim Crow. And when his undernourished children cried out for the necessities that his low wages could not provide, he showed them the Jim Crow signs on the buses, and in the stores, and on the streets, and in the public buildings. And his children, too, learned to feed upon Jim Crow, their last outpost of psychological oblivion. Thus, the threat of the free exercise of the ballot by the Negro and the white masses alike resulted in the establishment of a segregated society. They segregated Southern money from the poor whites. They segregated Southern mores from the rich whites. They segregated Southern churches from Christianity. They, southern, they separated Southern minds from honest thinking. And they segregated the Negro from everything. That's what happened when the Negro and white masses of the South threatened to unite and build a great society, a society of justice where none would prey upon the weakness of others, a society of plenty where greed and poverty would be done away, a society of brotherhood where every man would respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Do you know that if we followed King's vision today, we would have a beloved community of Democrats who care about racial justice, but also care about economic justice for Trump supporters? The poor whites that King had in mind were not necessarily marching in the civil rights movement. They may have been throwing bricks at him, but he loved them anyway because he loved neighbor and he loved even enemy all the way to the end. And he dedicated the last years of his life to a multiracial poor persons campaign that would unite people of all backgrounds on addressing injustices for all peoples. He cared about justice for blacks, but he also saw that justice had to do with class and not just race, it's both. And he wanted justice for all people, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their class. This is a kind of openness and understanding we need today, and we need it from all quarters, wherever we can get it. My hope is that Asian Americans can be one contributing voice to that dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>